Welcome to Your Success Podcast. We give you actionable insight and stories behind real life success wherever you go. Here are your hosts, Angelos and Mo. Welcome to Your Success Podcast. I'm Angelos. And I'm Mo. And today we're very privileged to be talking to the one and only Rob Moore. Rob is a disruptive entrepreneur with a passion for Ferraris and amazing watches. He's written multiple best-selling books, um, including Property Investing Secrets, Multiple Streams of Income, Life Leverage, and Money. He also runs a successful property education company called Progressive Property, and has multiple streams of income, and has a multiple streams of income company called Unlimited Success, and also hosts two podcasts, The Disruptive Entrepreneur and Money which are very, very good podcasts. Thank you. And if that wasn't enough, he has also held multiple Guinness World Records for the longest speech marathon. So welcome, Rob. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rob, that's a pretty impressive CV. Uh, many of our listeners uh, will, um, and the people that are watching online uh, will know your story. But for the people that don't, can you give us a short history of how it all began for you? Short for the Guinness Short. Book of so <laughs> yeah. for the longest speech. Aim for five to seven minutes. Five to seven yeah. minutes. <laughs> All right. So um, my dad was an entrepreneur. Uh, he met my mum in my mum and in my mum's parents, my grandparents' pub. Fell in love with her, and then they set up a pub. And then thirty odd years in the pub trade, buying and selling pubs, bars, clubs, restaurants, whatever he could get his hands on. And that's how I was raised. We're always moving around. I always sort of saw him with big wads of money in his pocket. He was always doing deals. You know, like if he bought a pub, he'd go to all these auctions and liquidation sales to buy all the the kitchen stock and all the cutlery and all the stuff for the pubs and the restaurants. And um, he had a massive thriving business in the um, Mildenhall Lake and area when the Gulf War was on, when they were before the Gulf War was on, you know, when all the Americans were over in yeah. the bases. And then when the Gulf War happened, they all left and he's business struggled and he's very much the typical boom bust kind of entrepreneur um, and, and I guess I always just wanted to be like my dad um, and he got me working from a really young age he'd have me bo- uh, bottling up like in the um, in my dad's original pubs the, the you know the bar might be here and it's sort of like this long and narrow yeah. and the cellar you had to lift up and go down the yeah, cellar yeah, when yeah. you sort of cramp behind the bar and it's a vertical drop. Go down in the cellar and you had to go, um, and I just loved it all. I used to go down and carry these crates up. Six years old, carry massive crates like this. You know, and dad was like, go on son. And mum was like, mm, not sure about that. And I mean, he used to pay me a quid to, to restock all the shelves. And I'd go down to the local pound shop and I'd buy a picture of a Ferrari Testarossa or a Ferrari GTO or a Lamborghini Countach or whatever. Um, And yeah, he just got me working really young. Um, By the age of, what, 10, um, I was ironing for my mum 10 pence for a small item, 20 pence for a big item. And I was just sitting there ironing all day, um, making money out of that. And um, my mum and dad got me working in the pub from a really young age. Um, I think I was doing the till when I was about 11 years old because I was pretty good at at maths. I was carving by the time I was 13 years old. And... um, and then I got into the school system. So school, university, because that's what you're supposed to do. And I did architecture, which I had zero interest in. Um, but I, the subjects I was taught at school, I wasn't really passionate about. And I guess that flame sort of diminished. Now, I'm not against the school system. If you want to be a doctor, a dentist, a lawyer, you need to go down the school system. You know, it's not like, give me a knife for if you want to be a doctor. Um, but for, if you want to be an entrepreneur and if you want to, um, work for yourself that, that's often not taught school university so I had those seven years in the wilderness and then I went back to just help my dad out in his pub because he wasn't very well he was having a few um, health issues I ended up staying there for about three years and just sort of slowly I guess just lost my fire for anything and got lost and then on December the 15th 2005 my dad had a nervous breakdown in his pub in front of all of the customers. It was quite bad. He got um, sectioned by the police. The police came over and beat him to the floor in front of all the customers, um, put him in Ward 5. We didn't really see him for a few months. That was really hard for the family, especially my mum. Um, and in that moment, I remember standing outside the pub, freezing in December, seeing the police wrestling my dad, my sister bawling her eyes out, my mum there. And it's like everything stopped. And I had this like, what are you doing with your life? Because this is what it's become. 
and I felt responsible because my dad had put me through school. My dad was like probably the person who could least afford the private school at private school. But he'd never tell me that, and he'd always just get it done and get me into private school because he wanted me to have a good education. Um, and I felt really responsible for his health issues and his stress and, you know, like the, the cigarette, cigarette ban, you know, I mean, people like us buy pubs now and HMO them and convert them into flats, you know, like the, the pub industry is not like it was a decade ago or a generation ago. So the world changes and my mum and dad just didn't really have the skills to... Um, and so on that moment, December the 15th, I was like, I've got to do something with my life. And I didn't know what to do. And long story short, I went to a property networking event because a couple of people said I should get into property. And there I met Mark at the first one. I went to my business partner. Um, I JV with him in the first year we bought 20 properties. In the second year we bought 30. And in the third year we bought 50, give or take a few rap, rap numbers rounded up. So we had about 100 properties in my first three proper years in business. Um, mostly his money or his family money, then my family money, then external finance. Um, and of course, fast forward to now, well, you, you said my bio, I've got progressive and unlimited success, which in our best year, we did about 19 million pound in book business in those companies. Um, obviously we've got, that doesn't include our property portfolio. Um, and we've got about 720 units now we own or manage. We've got one development, we're cutting into 160 different, 160 units we're just about to get planning permission on um, I spend most of my time now with my family and um, I make Bobby's golf a priority he's playing in the European Championships in, and Bobby's your son isn't he yeah, yeah Bobby's yeah. my son he's just turned seven um, and yeah my podcast and sharing my content and writing the books that's kind of what I spend a lot what I spend a lot of my time on we've got about 70 staff so they've mostly got it covered they need a few ideas from me and they occasionally need me to solve big problems. They need, they need me to come up with some harebrained scheme or if there's a big problem, they need me to come in mm. and sort it out. Um, I would normally have maybe three or four meetings a week in the office. Um, that's the short version. So what, what, I, what I liked about your story as well is that you've said this before, you don't necessarily have to come from a sort of very impoverished background and have nothing to actually be a successful entrepreneur. It obviously does help some people in that they've got something to prove and they've not they've not actually had that money to start with. But you say that actually you came up came grew up in quite a good yeah. family and yeah, good I mean, background. I'm lucky my parents didn't get divorced. I mean, I've seen a lot of people and that must be hard. And I have to, I take that for granted. Um, I loved living in pubs because it, it was so noisy. And mum and dad would be downstairs and we'd be upstairs. And about six and four, my sister, we just had to look after ourselves. So we could do stuff like cooking, ironing, cleaning, and just being independent by the age of 10 or something like that, which I remember going to uni and one of my mates couldn't, couldn't boil an egg. Yeah. I had to teach him how to boil an egg and I could do the lot. Um, I should have like, done all their ironing for like, you know, a quid an item or whatever. Um, and you know, look, there are a lot of stories, a lot of entrepreneurs started with a really hard background because that drove them to want to make a difference and have a better life. And generally what happens is from a generation's point of view, if, if you don't have a lot, you have a void to want to go and make a lot. And then if you have a lot, you know, sometimes then, you know, there's a bit of dependency or spoiling of a generation. So the generations tend to reverse themselves. You know, a lot of Im immigrants, you know, if you take people like um, Ariana Huffington, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, they're all immigrants and they've had it fucking hard. Uh, and so they've had to, you know, and they, they value work and they feel grateful. We're talking generally because everyone's different. But, you know, there, there are a lot of these popular sort of, oh, I was so skin. I used to pick up fag butts off the floor. I used to go down KFC and lick people's fingers and now I'm a billionaire. Um, and, you know, like, but everyone's got their own story. And, you know, I think sometimes if you've been raised in a well-to-do family with good money and comfort, often it's hard to be yeah. successful yeah. because... I don't ever, you know, some people say, oh, well, you know, it's all about being self-made. And if anyone's got um, handed down money, that doesn't count. Of course it counts. It's just as hard to manage money you've been given as it is to earn yourself. In fact, I'd argue it's harder because, you know, if, if you give someone five million quid, they don't know what to do with it. All it's going to do is attract a load of problems. Yeah. Um, look at all the lottery winners who go bust. And I say my, um, you know, my background is probably somewhere in the middle where mum and dad always looked after me and paid for me and gave me a decent upbringing. They gave me a lot of freedom. 
and you know, I'm not being critical of my parents. I think you know they did everything for me. But like sometimes I knew I could fall back on them, uh, and, and in that regard, at a point in my life I needed more pain. And then when my dad had his nervous breakdown, that was the pain. So that was an equally upside event rather as much of a downside. Going back to when you were younger, Rob, you said you were quite naturally entrepreneurial looking at... I wasn't naturally entrepreneurial. Ah, I was born that... an entrepreneur. So I was you... raised an entrepreneur. Right, so yeah. that answers my question. So whether it's nurture or nature, so your father is effectively... Yeah, I don't, think, I don't think there's an entrepreneur gene. Okay. Uh, you know, until a doctor says, hey, look, you see those chromosomes? That's world number one golfer. See those different chromosomes? That's world number two. It's never going to happen. Is it? It's not like that. I think, I think we are infinite pure potential. Because if you look at it, I, like, I, have, I don't know how many autobiographies I've read and watched and all, uh, 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 gobble up all the, not, the Netflix documentaries. It must be thousands. And every story, when you go back, you see that they've been in a good environment. Like Steve Jobs got access to supercomputers at the right age, yeah. at the right time when the rest of the world didn't. Um, or the mentors that they've had, or like Matthew Side, who I interviewed yeah. on my podcast. On his street, all the best UK po um, ping pong Champions were on his street, and all the best coaches were in his town. Um, you know, and that's not born, th that's environment. And okay, sometimes you're lucky to be born in that environment, but you still have to make the best of what you've got. Um, and I've actually got quite good at a lot of things and great at nothing. And so I realize you can learn to, I can get quite good at things quite quickly. Um, so I know that I could pretty much learn anything if I wanted to. Now, there's people say, oh, well, you know, you're never going to be a world champion basketball player, but I'm never going to be a world champion anything. Because I'm an entrepreneur, and generally entrepreneurs have to be good generalists. I need to know a bit about sales, a bit about marketing, a bit about vision, a bit about leadership, a bit about HR, a bit about management. I need to be a good strategist. You know, I need to be able to create content. I need to be able to write speeches, be a public speaker. Or I'm never going to be the best in the world at any one of them. And I've kind of, in my life, like I've always thought, why could I not get good at anything? And that's because I just got bored once I got good. I had like three brown belts. Why didn't I just do one and get a second Dan? Because I got bored at Brown Belt. And I, got another one. Um, and I suppose what I'm now trying to raise my son to be is the best golfer in the world. Because the world doesn't really reward people who are not bad at a lot of things, unless you're an entrepreneur. Because you, you, you need to be a generalist, I think, to be a good entrepreneur. Um, and I've learned a lot of things in my life. And if you, you know, you guys have been with us a long time, and obviously you initially invested in our property courses years ago, and back then all I was doing was property, and I was, I probably ran the event, so I probably yeah, delivered yeah, them yeah. that you were in. And of course, you know, then I launch a podcast, then I do world records, then I have another company, then I get into all this other stuff, then I write new books, and we're just pretty much now got a digital media agency. We've got 44 clients who have podcasts that we manage their podcasts. Right. I'll probably have an intake of another sort of 22 or 23. I'm pretty sure we'll turn into a social media agency because as you know, the better you get on social media, the more it helps your podcast. And the more you know about social media, the more you can realize you yeah. can teach others. Mm -hmm. And this is what I love about being an entrepreneur is there's always something new. There's always a, a, a way to get into something exciting. And I get bored really easily, most entrepreneurs do. Um, so yeah, but they're all these things are things I've learned. I weren't born with any yeah. of this. Um, Taking that forward then, Rob, so for example, you look at billionaires, Bill Gates and others, and they have children. How do you strike that balance in your child to make sure that they're hungry enough to want to do something for themselves and create their own space within the world without falling back onto their wealthy parents? Yeah, so I think the important thing in your life and your kid's life is to teach yourself and the children, what the world really is. And I think we often have an imbalanced or naive or deluded fantasy, but not always in the positive about the, what the world is. Um, and I've got a, um, someone who's really helped me in this over the last few years. His name's John Demartini. And I think in my life, if I, I look at the, the periods, the seasons I've gone in my life, I've either been very negative and always seen the downside in things and beating myself up a lot and being a victim to circumstance. Or I've gone on a load of Tony Robbins courses and personal, which I'm not criticizing, I love them. <coughs> but I'm like, woo, you know, <laughs> like, we can be positive about everything. Um, oh, your dog just died. Oh, it doesn't matter, I'm still happy. I could choose to be happy. Yeah, but one. your dog's just <laughs> been knocked over in the middle of the road. Oh, I'm happy. <laughs> um, and you know, I, I now believe, and I've never seen any proof to the contrary, 
that every event has an equal upside and downside. So the, the upsides of me raising my children in an environment that they're being raised in is, you know, maybe they learn about money better than others, but maybe they also have a little bit of, I, I do think my kids get too many toys and it's not because I buy them, it's just, you know, we, we, all the family just buy them loads of toys, Gemma's always buying them loads of toys. Um, I, I can't help where I live and what I give them and where we take them. And, you know, if you take them around the world because you can afford to, there's an upside to that because they get to see the world and it makes them more worldly. And because the downside is they can expect things. So as soon as I think my kids are getting a bit expectant yeah. or entitled, it's and it's not their fault, it's my fault. It's not their fault. You can't blame them. I just try and get them. I want them to learn the value of, of what it takes to earn praise from others money, um, the feeling of achieving something, because the feeling of achieving something isn't getting given it, it's working for it, it's going through challenge for it. And so that's what I'm always trying to do with my kids. I'm trying to, I want to obviously raise them and then have a good life, but I'm trying to give them enough challenge. Um, now other families have got the opposite where it's all challenge and sometimes they need support. Um, so with Bobby, I tried to, um, I don't give him any money and he doesn't get any pocket money off me. He has to earn the money. Now, mostly that's through golf at the moment, and so I'm trying to get the reward of the golf, not just the passion in the golf, but the reward, because um, that's what the world's like. Ultimately, if you practice hard at golf and you play well at golf and you win a competition, you get a reward. Uh, and in life, I think if you solve a problem or you care for someone or you fix something or you create something, uh, then you get a reward. And, and that's what the world is. And it's fucking hard at times, and it knocks you down. And so that's what I've got to make sure that they see what the world is really like and, and not either imbalance. Yeah. That makes sense. I think, um, is it Holly and Sam Branson, Richard Branson's yeah. um, kids, I think they've, they've done a lot of charitable work and set up their own foundations mm. and things like that, as rather than going after big business and sort of trying to emulate what's already well, gone your son's, before. Your son's got a great mentor, hasn't he, and a great inspiration. So no doubt he is going to kick ass in the world of golf. Are you, are you worried yeah. that he'll get to an age that he'll just be like, I'm not really into golf anymore? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose that's one of my, one of the things in my life I do sort of fear. Um, and if I'm being honest and self-aware, there's a part of me that's living vicariously yeah. through my son because, you know, I really loved golf. Um, and there's a lot of people that talk about that, like, like that's some really bad thing. I think we're all vicariously living mm -hmm. through our kids because generally what I have observed is that the things that happened to us through our parents and our upbringing that we liked and saw as good, we try and pass on to our kids. And the thing that we saw as not good and we didn't like, we try and protect our kids from. But that's our perception and that's not necessarily the reality, it's our reality. Um, and actually any event you give to your children can, be, can have both a spontaneous upside and downside. Some of the biggest mistakes I've made as a parent have also made my kids independent and strong. And some of the things I perceive to have been the best things I've done to my kids have, have got downsides. Um, so I, I think, you know, yeah, we've got to find out what's best for our kids, but we do naturally pass our values down to our kids. And then also I've got my idea of how I want to raise my kids. And then my wife's got her idea and that's different. And then my kids have got their own idea. <laughs> and, and as parents, we're sometimes, well, who, who are your kids? Now, there's, I, I was very specific about the golf thing with Bobby. Uh, and I realized that, um, that I have some extreme tendencies with, with this, but I also, I have some extreme tendencies myself and I'm okay with that um, because they have extreme upsides as well as extreme downsides. So like I th way before Bobby was born, I thought, well, how do I want to raise my kids? And I thought, well, I've been a generalist and I think the world, unless you want to be an entrepreneur, rewards specialists, like the best in the world, make all the money, get all the brand, get all the reach, whether it's, you know, being good at being a social media influencer or a sports personality or, you know, mathematician or someone who wins a Nobel Prize or a scientist, the best get inordinate amount of results, money, success. Um, so I thought, well, that's how I want to raise my child to be one of the best at something. Um, and then I thought about, well, what could that be? Um, what has a long career? What is going to connect me with them? What could I be involved in? Because, you know, I, all right, well, be, be like Mozart. But I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be able to connect with Bobby playing the violin eight hours a day because it's not. So, I mean, one of the greatest gifts about golf is the time that Bobby and I get to spend together. And whether he makes it or not as, as a golfer, what will be left is the hours and hours a week I get to spend with Bobby, which is the greatest gift. 
Um, and Bobby and I just, um, like, we, he played a golf competition. And he's, at the moment, he's beating 11 and 12 year olds, hands down. Um, and we played in a golf competition at a course called Brampton Heath. And it's a short course and he beats everyone. He beats like 14 year old kids. Um, and he played it and he was two over gross after eight, which was really good. He was completely annihilating the field. And he finished with a triple bogey. He was a bit unlucky. He just went out of bounds. And we finished. Um, and then he was a bit down, which I thought was good. Because he's got to, you've got to learn defeat. You can't just learn victory, you've got to learn defeat. Um, and as soon as we were in the car on the way back, he said, oh, daddy, I want to go back next week and, and play at Brampton Heath. And I was like, are you sure? And he's like, it's an hour away. He's like, yeah, yeah, what I want to do, daddy, is I want to listen to heavy metal songs on the way. <laughs> and I want to talk about uh, my football stickers and I want to go and play at Brampton Heath. And I just thought, it does not matter what happens. That is what life is yeah. about with your kids. Um, so I'm going to do everything I can to raise an amazing golfer because I think that the gifts are so great. And, and, and it, his last summer, we had a bit of a moment where he was kicking back and um, I had to back off. And it was hard um, because when he was five, his scores would have won the world under six. Um, so I backed off and it was hard. Um, and, and now he's enjoying it more again. Yeah. Um, and now, of course, he's doing great. And I'm getting excited again. Um, and the downside of me being excited is I'm overexcited, which means, you know, like that, that seeps through to pressure. So with the Euros in a couple of weeks' time, I'm still dreaming every day that he's going to be winning that trophy. Um, as much for him as me, but of course, I'm going to, get, I'm going to be doing a Facebook post on that if he does. <laughs> and I'm going to be doing one if he loses as well. Um, but the trip to Scotland and all the memories that we we've, we've done some amazing things like um, David Ledbetter, who's um, like probably one of the best coaches in the world. He coached Nick Faldo. Um, I'm interviewing him on my podcast and he's we're going to go to one of his competitions that he runs because he's got like a big academy. And he said, I'll bring your son and I'll watch him and we'll play a bit of golf together. And that's just like a dream for me. Nick Faldo was my idol. Uh, and I get to meet his coach, interview him on my podcast. Bobby comes along and play some golf together. So what if Bobby becomes a pro or not? I'm, we're going to remember that stuff for the rest yeah, of our lives. Yeah. And when you're an entrepreneur, the curse can be you get up before they get up and you go to work and you come back from work before, after they go to bed and you never see kids. And, the, and I have that balance where I see my kids all the time. And I've, I, I want to do the same with Ariana, but I'm going to coach her in a different way with golf. I'm very hands-on with Bobby, but I'm going to play the other card, which is like hands-off. So hopefully she comes to us because she's younger. Normally the younger siblings, you know, they get it from the older sibling. So Bobby gets it from me and maybe she'll get it from him. But she's a feisty little ginger nutter. And she, <laughs> she, she's definitely going to be like an actress. She's going to be a diva. Yeah, yeah, she's going to be a diva. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If they're like, like the world's biggest diva. She's going to be, which of course she's got all from mm. yeah, yeah. her mum. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I, know, I know we're talking round yeah. this, but, but, um, I, but I find it very interesting what you're saying, Rob, because I'm an expectant father. And I've, wow, congratulations. Yeah, yeah, my first one. That, that is I'm, exciting, man. I'm really excited. Yeah. And it's actually changing my life already, the way I'm thinking about things and everything. And what you said earlier about living through your children, I guess I have fulfilled my mum's ambitions of being an entrepreneur because she was never given that opportunity because yeah. she was held back um, to create a business. Yeah. Um, for various reasons and I guess in some ways she has pushed me along over the past 10 12 years to achieve certain things and it, you, I acknowledge that but I'm also very happy that that has happened as well and I'm yeah. just curious what's going to happen with the next generation how I'm going to be with my child so it's just very interesting hearing how you've done it you're going to make them the number one Star Trek number uh, one Star fan. Trek fan yeah yeah. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> yeah yeah talking about fans you know what Bobby said to me I took him to his first Liverpool game um, and I I, I got a, a really good deal off a, ge a very generous guy who, who's a radio DJ. I won't say his name in case he doesn't want to, but I want to because he's, he's such a great gift. Mm -hmm. He's given me some, a couple of tickets. Um, and it was in hospitality because when he's seven, I don't want him to hear all the language and all that. He has enough of that off of me. <laughs> um, so, like, and, it's, you know, and I hired a driver to go. I wanted it to be a great experience for him. Uh, and um, it, just before he went, he said, Daddy, at home I support Liverpool, but at school I support Man United. <laughs> And I'm like, that is over. Yeah. So I'm really excited for you that you, you've got a child. Yeah. I, I think that as an entrepreneur and as a parent, I do this and I've, I, I've, I've coached and mentored, I was going to say thousands, hundreds of thousands of people now. And um, we all beat ourselves up about shit. Shit we did wrong, shit we didn't do, shit we did do, shit we should have done, shit we could have done, shit we would have done. 
And you know what? For everything you beat yourself up, there is um, a, a, a balanced gift. And I'll give you an example. Um, I was have you know, like kids can push you to the edge. Um, and you learn, you know, I remember John Demartini saying to me when I told him I was expecting, and he basically said, well, you know, I said something like, I'm really looking forward to passing on my knowledge. And he's sort of like, he did this in, in the way that a 60 year old elder would do it, would. He basically laughed in my face, but as a 60 year old <laughs> yeah, elder yeah, yeah. would. Oh yes, Rob. <laughs> but basically he was like, ah, you think you're going to teach your kids yeah. everything? They'll teach you as much as you teach them. And you know, no one can really take, because the greatest gift when you're a parent, especially a father, is part on the wisdom <laughs> from generation to generation. Yeah. Um, and like, you know, I, I learned as much from them. And um, we, I had this moment where Bobby was pushing me and I was losing the plot a bit. And we, he just really pissed me off and vice versa. And I pushed him away. And as he pushed, because he had his golf bag on, he fell over. And of course he started crying. And it was the shock. It wasn't like child abuse. But I mean, if someone had been live feeding that, I'd have been in <laughs> trouble. It was yeah. like, go away. And we've all done it. But like, and I immediately felt like, like the worst parent ever. And I felt really shit and really guilty. Um, and he made me he, he <laughs> suffer. And I picked him up, put him in the car. And we, we, we were something like this. <laughs> he was like four years old at the yeah, time yeah. as well. And, like, and immediately after that, because of the in, insane guilt, I went and bought about... 50 parenting audiobooks. I listened to every single one and I just thought, you know what, I'm going to be a better parent. Now, had that, hadn't, had that not have happened, I wouldn't have done that. Mm. You know, like all the great ones from Steve Bidoff, all the Raising Kids ones, um, all the, the love languages for kids, all of that, listen to them all. And I probably became a better parent because mm. of that. Yeah. Um, and also, he found a boundary of me and he learned that further than that boundary, so there, was, there were gifts in that. And, we, we need, and that's the same with being an entrepreneur. And, and, and instead of seeing everything as a gift and a lesson, often we just pick out our own mistakes. Yeah. yeah. Well, you've been listening to Your Success Parenting <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah, very much. Look, look forward to the unlimited success um, parenting, yeah. Yeah. Uh, parenting course. One day I'm definitely going to write a book yeah, on it. Yeah, you should. Um, but, you know, my kids are seven and four, and so I don't feel like I've mm. got enough experience yet unless I was writing a, kid, a book on raising seven and four-year-olds. Yeah. Um, but like my son knows all the denom denominations of money in most countries. Um, he knows he knows all the um, richest golfers in the world. Um, he knows what Krugerrands and bullion is. So um, I felt it was really important from a young age to get them learning about money. They, they didn't teach you that in school. Right. Going back to business, Rob. So you've created some pretty awesome businesses. That's for sure. With progressive and limited success. Um, and you've done that with your business partner, Mark Homer. Can you explain why your partnership works so well? Yeah, I mean, he may have a different view on this. <laughs> we'll get him in. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you, um, I think that uh, I trust him and he trusts me, and that it is worth so much more than anything else, really. Uh, we cut a deal in the early days where anything he wants to do, fine. He has to cut me in 50%. Anything he wants uh, the other way around, also um, stands and I see a lot of people in partnerships and instead of looking about all the things their partner brings they often think oh well, they're not working very hard and, um, oh well, they're not really delivering and I'm frustrated with them um, and I learned not Im immediately but probably about nine months into my partnership with Mark once I stopped trying to change him and started stepping up myself, our partnership improved. And of course, you know, we all know the quotes, be the change you want to see. And, you know, I think we all get that intellectually. But when you actually see the results of how you change towards someone, how they change, that's very profound. So I said to myself, I want to be as great a partner as I can be to Mark. I want to be the one that brings 51% of the value. Uh, Whereas maybe I was looking, oh, you don't work as hard as I do, you don't do as much as I do. But he had other values, like his experience and his money and his knowledge, which I didn't have. So I shouldn't be measuring it. We measure people on our values. I shouldn't have been measuring him on his, my values. I should be measuring him on his own. Didn't really matter if he worked an hour a day. If he puts all the money in for a property, that's worth 10 hours a day from me. Um, so I think a, a combination of we're very different, um, we trust each other, we did a deal which gave us freedom to explore. Um, so, which, so I found some companies and he's found some things. Um, and trying to be a good partner rather than trying to s sandwich and squeeze your partner into how you want them to be. 
So on the flip side of that then, Rob, there must have been times where there's potentially been a slight difference of opinion or different there's direction. Difference of opinion every day. How do you resolve that without fracturing everything that you've created? Um, I think I know his boundaries and he knows mine. And so I think, okay, I have a choice now. Am I going to go beyond that boundary? And if I do, I have to accept what the consequences are. Um, and it's not, why it's not necessary to cross that boundary. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there, there's a lot in this question. Um, I think that managing your own emotions is the hardest, but one of the most valuable skills in business in general. Um, so sometimes Mark will say something to me and I'll think, fuck you. <laughs> and then I have to go, wait a minute, Mark isn't saying this at me. Mark is being Mark. I'll give you an example. When Mark wants to fix a problem, he'll talk to you like you're five years old. Like there is no better patronizer on the planet <laughs> than Mark when... He's in problem-solving mode, but he's in problem-solving mode and he wants to fix the problem. And if he wants to be really clear to fix the problem and he wants to talk to you like a five-year-old, then, but he doesn't think he's talking to me like a five-year-old. I think he's talking to me like a five-year-old because other people in my past have talked to me like that and I felt like a five-year-old. So all my baggage is coming out when he says that. He's, he's, he's just trying to fix the problem. Um, also, it's like, I will be doing something for about a year and then when it goes wrong, Mark will come in and go, oh, look at all this, look at all that. And I'm like, yeah, mate, I've been doing that a year and now you want to help. But he's not like going, oh, Rob, you've been doing this for a year and messing up. He's going, we have a problem. I want to fix it. And Mark is like the best person when there's an emergency. But when he gets into emergency mode, obviously all the niceties are out the window, but you need them out the window. So sometimes w when Mark's in certain modes, it will bring up baggage that I've got in my life. And I know that's the same when I do certain things with Mark, when I say racy comments, um, you know, or uh, when I crash his Ferrari <laughs> into the News International <laughs> building. Like now, when that happened, Mark had every right to go, you can fuck off the fleet insurance. We're not sharing cars anymore. I've had enough. I'm not dealing with your insurance and your, you know, because he has to deal with the insurance and all of this and all of that. You're doing it on your own. But no, he like, he, he sorted that out. He, he fixed my problem. Um, but that's because he knows I can do things he can't. And we have this equitable relationship. Um, I think also it's really important to pick out the things that people do well. And I always try and tell Mark how much I value him and appreciate him. Um, and I know he does it when his wife tells him to, you know. <laughs> um, no, I know he does it too. And it's not always easy. It's not always easy to say, do you know what? I think you're awesome. I really value you. Because, you know, like, I don't know why I find that a bit awkward. I feel quite vulnerable. Um, but, I, you know, like I like to tell him a lot how great he is. Um, I think if we hold people to our own expectations, we'll always be disappointed. And this is the same in relationships as well. Um, you know, like, oh, well, why wasn't this person like that? Why wasn't this per Why didn't this person do this? Because they never will, because they are them. Mm. And people will always be themselves. And then when you try and change them, you're always going to be disappointed. And when you expect them to be more like what you want them to be like, if you want them to be, you know, better salesperson and they're in the wrong role, or you want an ops person to be strategic, or you want a strategic person person to be operational. So, always help people to their own standards, not yours. Uh, and so I've got to know Mark over time. Like at the moment, Mark and I are trying to buy a couple of Ferraris, and I just want to buy the fuckers. And Mark, it's like we go through all this pain of all this research and analysis. Um, and when we go through, no, it's not pain for him. He actually really enjoys it. So look at my projection. It's pain yeah, to me. Yeah. But I'd go and buy a £170,000 Ferrari Testarossa that I should have paid £130,000 for. 
Um, a mark will go and pay £110,000 for a car that should have been £130,000, but it'll take 48 years. <laughs> and he will just grind down the cellar until they say, look, you can have the car, but fuck off and don't come in near me ever again. And do you know, the gift is the balance. So, like, um, we're looking at buying an Aventador um, convertible for our, like, da da daily, it's not a daily sports car because we have daily cars, but it's our, like, you know, supercar. Um, and it's taken me about five years to break him to get that. Uh, and I think it was the flaming exhaust uh, that finally got him. Um, but yeah, he, that, he will make that what, last two months, but we'll get a good car at good money. Um, but if it weren't for me, Mark wouldn't have bought anything or enjoyed his life, really. And that, that's not fair. I've helped exaggerate that and, and accelerate that process. But if it weren't for him, I'd have just made a crazy amount of mistakes. And I think in his own words, he'd say the same thing. So do you see yourselves as a creative elastic band? You're pulling, he's pulling you back, but then you'll yeah. pull him along and you'll catch up with each yeah. other. Yeah, that's important. Now, here's the thing. If you surround yourself with people who don't have that push-pull, 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 you're going to grow either steadily or not at all. Um, if you, the, the Five Dysfunctions of a Team is a really good book on this. Um, but if you have people around you that challenge you, you grow at the optimum capacity. Because if you grow too much, you break. And if you're growing too fast and getting a bit ahead of yourself like I do, you need, I've got my wife, my business partner, our MD. If I grow too fast, they're like, Rob, what are you doing? Calm down, whoa, slow down. And it pisses me off in the moment. Um, but at times I pull them quickly and it pisses them off in the moment. Um, so... Yeah, they're like Radiohead, one of my favourite bands. Uh, and they, you know, like when they released uh, the album after OK Computer, so they did like a dual album, Amnesiac and Kid A. And basically, Tom York was like, I don't want celebrity status. I don't want to write another album that's really successful. Screw success. Uh, and, you know, like just comp whatever you expect Tom York to do is going to do the opposite. And I love that creativity. I love the courage to go, I know I can write another album which is gonna sell millions of copies and go to number one in America, and I'm gonna do the complete opposite. I know everyone wants us to play guitars, so no guitars in these albums. That takes courage, and, and I admire that. Um, and so the drummer, Phil Selway, he was like, um, I'm not doing any drums, Tom, give me some freaking drums, man. And like, there's, not, there's very sparse drumming and guitars. Yeah. Um, I just want to write three and a half minute pop songs like we did last time, and you know, but I want to I play some drums here. So like the first song on the album is just do a kick, and he must be like, man, this is good. Yeah, I'm like, we're doing an album and this is, this is all I'm doing. But you've got that versus Tom wanting to go off on some completely new digital thing. Then you've got Johnny Greenwood who's got all these classical influences and all of that creative tension. I mean, they're, they're not all going, oh, let's hold hands and write an album. They'll be having arguments. They'll be, you know, there's this creative tension. They've all got different musical in, uh, influences. Um, and, uh, and that makes for very progressive music. And also a very progressive. Yeah. yeah. Very yeah, good, very good. Yeah, good. Very good. yeah. <laughs> and, um, and also, when there's two of you, just from a back, you get twice as much done. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. So just, I wanted to Thanks pick up on your relationship with Mark and also to ask you. We're not together, by the way. No, no. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just the way you say it. Um, <laughs> how do you celebrate success together? Because obviously you've had a lot of successes as a business and do you, how do you celebrate that? And then also you, just individually, how do you celebrate success? Um, probably not as much as I should. Um, yeah, I don't drink. Uh, my, I was going to say only, only did you vice. Have, and then I was, did you ever drink, sorry? Yeah. Well, you did? Okay. Yeah. So that's a conscious thing. Yeah, too. thank God they weren't doing camera phones <laughs> at uni. Yeah, yeah, I used to okay. drink. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and yeah, hey, look, I'm not against it. It's just it stopped working for yeah, me. Yeah. Um, I'll have a drink now and I'll get a red face and a three day hangover. What's the, what's the point? The enjoyment's gone. So I'm not like, I'm not like a, a preacher about it. It just don't work for me. Um, so, so, like, I, I don't go out late. Um, so, you know, like, it's very. You know, I'm not, I'm not really that social. I'm a bit awkward socially. It's funny because, like, I've had, um, 
I've had periods in my life when I've been a real introvert. Like when I was an artist, I was a real introvert. And I've had periods in my life when I've been a real extrovert. And, and I seem to, don't, I don't know what I am. I don't know if I'm an introvert or an extrovert. And they call, there's actually a name for them, ambiverts. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, fucking hell, there's a name for someone like me. I don't know what I am. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I want to wear crazy clothes like this, and then sometimes I just don't want anyone to see me or talk to me. Um, and it's, it seems to be a bit mm. cyclical and seasonal. Um, so how, do you, how do you manage that within your business, though? Make it's, sure that no one sees me when I'm in one of those yeah. antisocial moods. No live feeds at three o'clock in the afternoon or nine o'clock at night, <laughs> dribbling. Um, and, and, and try and I, I compartmentalise my diary at times when, if I'm with people, I'm in those moods because, you know, I really enjoy doing this. I love doing interviews. Um, and I love doing speeches. I know if I do a speech at the wrong time, I'm going to be, like, be a bit like, uh, and I don't want to ever be like that. Um, and I'm really proud to say that, um, you know, like, I've never rebuffed anyone if they've come and asked me for an autograph or to talk to me or whatever. And I'm not an A-lister, but, you know, I do get recognised everywhere I go now. And, and, and everyone's allowed a bad day, but I don't want to, but that's environment. I was having dinner with Kevin Clifton last night. He's, you know, obviously really famous. Mm. We're having dinner and some guy came up and he was just like, oh, wow, it's Kevin and all that. And it was just great with him. And I just thought, you know what, that's how you should be. Um, and then actually he said, oh, Kevin, I've been on a few of your tours. And then he gave me a story afterwards of someone who he knows who's basically like piss off to anyone who wants to talk to him. Uh, now, that guy's been on your tours and paid you money and then you've gone... Yeah. And I really admire people who take time for people. Yeah, yeah. Now, when I'm in the zone and good energy, I'll sit and take loads of time for people. I've done it for hours and I love doing it. But I'm a human being. And if I'm really knackered and uh, then... So I just, I've, I've planned my day and my diary so that when I need to be alone and when I'm a bit of an introvert. Like, what was the question? That's really important. Well, 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 it started with success, success. but I think the, what, you've, what you've been discussing there is just... So to, celebrate Well, no, I think what you just discussed there is, is about self-awareness and it's so powerful to mm. actually know your, yourself mm. and the rhythms of your own day and week yeah. and month. And a lot of people think, oh, Rob, where'd you get your energy from? I've probably got a, a, a similar level of energy to most people. It's just that when you see me publicly, it's all there. Yeah. But at 7.30 at night, you never see me do a live feed at 7.30 at night. I never do interviews mm. because I'm dribbling on my Netflix remote control. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so back to your question about um, celebrating success. Yeah. Um, I try and have moments with Mark where I'll go a bit down memory lane because the, the curse of being an entrepreneur is you're always, I want to be there in a year. I want to be there in a year. I want to be there in a year. I want to be there in a year, five years, 10 years. Um, and you forget that last year, well, you wanted to be where you are now, but you're not honoring it because you just always move the goalposts out a year. And if you're not careful, then you'll get to the end of your life and you ne you know, you, you are, you've got to enjoy your life now while you're at it, breathe it in, enjoy it, have fun. Um, so every now and again with Mark, I'll say, oh, do you remember when we did this? Or I'll just, we'll stoke a story of something that we did 10 years ago. Or Mark and I, for example, when we used to run events, and I haven't told many people this, so I hope you haven't got millions of followers, <laughs> which you probably have. It's going to be embarrassing. <laughs> but, um, we couldn't afford to get, um, we had to buy the cheapest hotels when we used to go and do events. And often you've just got a double bed. So we'd go to an event and then we'd sleep in the same bed. You know, like arse cheek to arse cheek. <laughs> um, and um, those were the days. And like, much you remember when, you know, and um, just, you know, like we've stayed in some right shitholes. Uh, and, you know, I used to remember when I was an artist days when I couldn't even afford to have dinner. Um, and then when Mark bought our first, we bought our first Ferrari halves and, you know, uh, when we've, we've done certain things along the way. And remembering where you were, comparing yourself to where you were, rather than comparing yourself to your idols and heroes and where you want to be, that's how you enjoy success. So, um, I really feel the closest to my wife when we talk about where we've come in our relationship and I feel closest to Mark when we have those chats. And how we do that is we have to make time together. So at the moment, Mark and I, like I said, we're researching the Ferraris we want to buy for investment and enjoy. Um, and we're doing a lot of research together and we're going and viewing cars. Uh, and so we're, we're spending a lot of time together and that's great. Now Mark and I have had times when we haven't spent time together for weeks. Um, and I need to listen to him and, him and honour what he does and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. 
Um, so you mentioned earlier you focus a lot on social media and personal branding these days. How has social media and working on your personal brand improved on, or, and or accelerated your businesses? Um, well, I haven't signed a pair of breasts yet. <laughs> Here so, you go that, off. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll know. Right. I'm going to write my full name when I do. <laughs> I'll know. Like I'm a bit. I'm into like D list yeah. when, when I've done that. Yeah. Um, so how, how's it? So Mark and I made a strategic decision maybe five or six years ago that we didn't want progressive property to be reliant on Rob and Mark from a brand perspective for a number of reasons. Number one is it would limit our growth if everyone expected to see Rob and Mark. We run 750-ish training days a year. That's, that's two, nearly two training days a day. And obviously I'm not doing, I'm doing 10, 20, I don't know of those. So if everyone thought progressive property is Rob and Mark and then they turn up and it's not Rob and Mark, they're going to be unhappy. So we knew in order to grow, we had to let go. The second thing, if we wanted a saleable, scalable business, we knew it had to be progressive property, not Robert Mark. So, and, and the more long-term you are in the planning of this, the, the less short-term pain you have. Because if one day you go, sorry, Robert Mark aren't in the progressive building anymore. The staff are like, well, I used to be able to go and see Robert Mark, and now I can't, I'm not managed by anyone, just get on with it. All the customers are like, where are Robert Mark on? I want refunds, uh, you know, and it, and, it, and it can be a mess. So um, strategically, we went through that process, and that could probably take six months to two years, depending on how um, on it you are um, in the planning of that. You're best off starting early and communicating early that that's where you're going, and then you'll have less attrition. Um, once I've done that, there was a few things at play. Number one is um, I tend to empty my time, fill my time, empty my time, fill my time, empty my time, fill my time. Uh, and I think that's naturally, I think, um, is it the Parkinson's law of time, if you research that, you'll basically fill time and space um, according to there being time and space, you know, unless you prioritise um, important things first. The world will fill your time with its own problems unless you fill your time with your own priorities. And so um, I wrote Life Leverage, and that was, what, nearly three years ago now. Um, and that was when I'd got myself to the point where I could honestly hand on heart say I, could, I did not have to work another day in my life. And after a week of not working, I was bored shitless. And like, I am not a good board because I just annoy the shit out of everyone. <laughs> I'll go and find three business opportunities. I'll go and create problems where there are not. I will always start talking about work in, in sort of non-work situations. I'll go and find problems that aren't there because I'm bored. And I don't make a very good board. Um, so I've tended to expand, contract, expand, contract, expand, contract. Um, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs can relate. So once I'd created this void of, well, there's no more work, then I thought, well, I've got to do something. So then I wrote Life Leverage. And once I, once I finished Life Leverage, I was like, what do I do now? And then I launched my podcast pretty much because I created a void. And so the social media, my podcast, what you might call my own brand, it's just me filling space. Yeah. Um, and I've got the choice to do nothing, which to me is retirement. Uh, and, and, and if there, you know, like there is a, a US kids world under sevens, which we decided not to do last year, but Bobby qualified for. If Gemma said to me tomorrow, I want to do it, I'm booking the flights, I'm, be, I'm there. And I can make that decision, I could go tomorrow and just clear my diary. To me, that's retirement. But retirement isn't having nothing to do, because I am the worst having nothing to do. Um, so defining what retirement, financial freedom, choice means to you is really important. And I was always defining it by society's definition of not mine. Uh, not mine. Um, the next thing is, despite the fact that I've got progressive property systemized, saleable and scalable, I felt like it was important to have my own assets, books, podcasts, social media channels, um, for future products I might launch. Um, I also enjoy doing it. I really enjoy connecting with my communities. Um, I'm often given feedback of how responsive I am. Uh, and I'll find people who found their way to my 25 and 50 grand mentorship programs. And, and what won them over was because they sent me a private message and I replied and I was personal to them. And I'm going to have to lose that when I've got 20 million, 10 million followers, whatever it might be. There'll be a point where I can't manage it anymore. At the moment, I'm doing it a lot. I've also got one outsourcer. I've also got my mum who does full-time management of one of my email accounts. So I'm already, you know, like 
I'm managing a lot. Um, because I think, you know, people can take your business away, you can have difficulties in a product or a service, there could be a recession, but if you have a personal brand, then, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk's just done, done, done that deal with K-Swiss and he's you know, releasing these trainers and I don't know what he's getting paid for that. And I was having a conversation about someone who knows someone who's a big time celebrity um, and they've just got paid two million pounds to do an endorsement deal where they basically had to do one day's work for it. So remembering that you're an asset as well as your property is an asset or your business has as an asset or your staff is an asset, you are an asset. I also just happen to really enjoy it. Yeah. Right. I think it's fair to say, Rob, you're a bit of a book writing machine, but you're bucking the trend where it's not necessarily less is more. More is great. Yeah. Which works well with your surname. Yeah. But how do you write so much content for your book and consistently keep it at a great level? Um, I've had done a lot of therapy to find out that writing for me is therapy. So there's quite a paradox in that. But to me, content, writing, interviewing, podcasting, yeah, there's a business benefit, there's a brand benefit, there's an exposure benefit, there's, you know, the benefits, you know, like if there were none of those, would I do it? But I've worked this out recently. There's a therapeutic, cathartic benefit to it. So I've tried to develop my emotional skills over the years such that when I get upset with the things, customers, staff, followers, critics, trolls, haters, wankers, wives, kids, the, the whole world, every day, any, and I'm not criticizing any of them, but every day, one or more of them is going to do something that upsets you. Now, in the past, I used to go either nothing and hold it all in, and then every six months have a massive meltdown, and people do this, this is more common than you think, um, or when I actually grew some, I'd fight back, and I'd, I'd have all these unnecessary fights. And so what I do try and do now, I'm, you know, like it's always a work in progress, and there's still gonna be something that I'll, after I go, I fucking fell for that, or I know better, I've done all this personal development, <laughs> look at me. Um, like often when you hear me write, you see me writing thanks for feedback. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for your feedback. That actually means fuck off. <laughs> but you know, like I'm managing myself. And it's funny now because people know that now. So when I do a yeah. thanks for the feedback, they go, I know what that means. <laughs> so now I'm having to say thanks for sharing your opinion. Uh, but then now I'm saying that, but I know they know what that means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, you know, because this, this, there's probably two or three fights a year that are worth fighting. And the rest, they're worth letting go. Um, so that all gets stored. And then it just floods out in my books, my podcasts. It's just, it's just honestly, I like, um, I, I was right, I like wrote a book every two or three years, and then I wrote, started writing a book a year. I'll get four books done in these 12 months. And also, like, you know, conventional wisdom tells you, like, an, a, a, like a band, that, you know, you should release an album every one, two, probably every three years. There's a cycle. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> why? Who says you can't write four books in a year? If I've got four books that are bursting to get out, I'm writing them. Um, and I, I think because I'm trying to continually develop my emotional mastery and control how I react to situations, it is kind of storing in a bit, and then it just well, you have a flies out. It just I I, I can't really I, I can't. It just flies out. Yeah. You have a major publisher who obviously values what you put out but they will want their pound of flesh from you as well, Rob. So do you feel that there's a, a bit of pressure there or do you feel that potentially in the long term it may take away the pleasure of writing? I want to be their best author who sells the most books, who's the best to work with, who's the easiest to work with, who's the most fun. So like, you know, a lot of the time I hear a lot of people moaning about their publishers. But why? They're your publisher. Yeah. They're your partner. You know, like when you hear people moaning about your customers, like, you know, like I think you'd have to f do a hell of a lot of research to ever find if I've moaned about a customer. I'll defend myself if they're wrong, don't get me wrong, but I don't moan about my customers because my customers give me the life that I've got. I love my customers. Even when they hate me, I love them. <laughs> Even when I'm hating them in the moment, I love them in the long term, <laughs> like your kids, you know. Yeah. Um, so why, my, you know, I love my publishers. We've got some creative 
track, uh, like they wanted to call my next, uh, they want me to write a mindset book next. I've always wanted to write a mindset book because I think I know a lot about it and I've learned a lot about it, but I wanted to time it right. I didn't want to write it too early. But then Carol Dweck wrote a brilliant book called Mindset. And I'm like, so like in a way I've thought she's kind of ruined my timing. Because if I was writing a book, I'd have called it Mindset because I wrote a book on money called Money. Um, and she's written it and I thought, you know what, I need to wait. And let, good on her, well done. Um, she got there first. Bitch, you know, but, like, <laughs> um, but I need, so like, um, so I've said we need to wait, we need to wait, we need to wait, and he's like, now you got to write this book, and I, so I keep chucking him new ideas, new ideas. I got, you know, like um, this book I'm writing with Gerald called Reinventing Yourself. I think it's or working title because we might tweak it. Gerald, I think Gerald, Gerald Ratner. Ratner. So I think it's perfect book, perfect timing, perfect author, um, and I need to get that out fast. I really feel good about that, but I, I feel like I need to either wait a year or two or three years or I have a better concept, which is a mindset book, but it's a better concept. Um, and so um, my publisher came back and said, I want to write a book about winning. And I'm like, I don't want to write a book about winning. It's not what the book is about. Um, and then, you know, he's, he's pushing and I'm pulling and pushing and pulling. Um, uh, and I don't mind. I like, we had a little bit of a thing because they contracted me to write books between 50 and 70,000 words, which I didn't, I didn't read the full contract and see that. And I wrote a book that was 150,000 words and I spent all the time doing it back and forth and with the publisher. Uh, and then about three months after writing the book, he came back and just sort of said, oh, you know, we sort of got an agreement to write 50 or 70,000 words. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me that before? And he's like, well, it is in your contract. And so, um, so I'm trying to squeeze him up to write 120, 130,000, and he's trying to pull me down. And I learned stuff from him, and he learned stuff from me. And, and, and that forced me to ask him, why 50,000? Why 50,000? Because I can't even do an intro in 50,000 words. And he's like, well, that's the, <laughs> that's the ideal length, which makes the ideal size to go into Waterstones and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, finally, now I know. If you'd have told me that before, I'll write. So I'll make sure some of these books, like the, the Reinvent Yourself and the, the Mindset book, there'll be 70,000 words. Um, so that, you know, and, and by the way, he's a really great guy, the guy I work with, and we've got a good relationship, but there is this creative tension, which I enjoy, because it makes me a better author, better author, hopefully it makes him a better publisher, I've taught them shitloads of stuff, so much so that he wanted me to come and do a talk to his, in, to, they've got a massive building, to his entire team on how to launch a book, because, you know, we, we, we disrupt how to launch a book. Um, when I told him my fee, then, then it hasn't come about. But you know, I'll end up doing that. So I hope we, you know, but like, it can't all be roses. Yeah. Um, so is he getting a pound of flesh off me? Hopefully. I want to make them millions, because then I'm going to be making millions. I want to be their case studies. I want them to be, you know, I want the, 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 cause the better and my book sells, the more they're going to go and publish that. The better I am to work with, the quicker I am to work with, the more they're going to fight for me for the translation deals. Whereas, you know, if I'm going to be getting my pound of flesh and I'm not very grateful, that's going to come through. And then if there's a toss up between my book and another book in the publishers, who are they going to choose? Yeah. Right. Mm. And Rob, this podcast is all about success. And as such, we ask everyone we interview, what does success mean to you? Make money, make a difference. Um, I think there's too much hippie shit out there at the moment, which is like, oh, well, the most important thing in life is happiness. No, it ain't. Because if we all sat there in a circle, singing Kumbaya, feeling happy, when you're happy, you don't go out there and fix problems. You don't go out there and put yourself in uncomfortable situations and challenge yourself to get better, to grow, to fix problems, to eat the frog, to make the hard calls, whether it's customer services or sales or that big pitch you've got that you're shitting your pants about. You don't do any of that when you're happy. Um, and I think there's a lot of, oh, well, it's, you know, I just want to raise happy kids. It's just all like... Um, it's too one-sided. It's dangerous. We're going to create a load of entitled hippies who can't dig themselves out of a hole if we're not careful. Now, I know that's a generational reaction to when it was really hard in the coal mines and all that kind of stuff. So I think your greatest happiness is when you have endured a big challenge and you come out the other side and you win. 
So to me, success is about solving problems, fixing things, growing, getting through uncomfortable situations, sales, marketing, building a team, doing things that matter, that last, that are meaningful, that people value you for, that you struggle to get through. That is success, not easy wins, not happiness. Um, and and, and I, sometimes people think that I'm anti-happiness because I'm not. I'm always striving for happiness because human beings are. But give me everything I want and nothing to do and I'm not happy. And humanity needs to be on that border of support and challenge. Yeah. You know, like where we're always pushing to evolve our species, to mutate and to be able to survive the environment. And um, So get comfortable with being uncomfortable, basically. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great exactly. answer. Exactly. And if you had to pick one thing that's contributed the most towards your success, what do you think that would be? I'm not very good at one thing answers. I'm good at it's seven, gotta be nine, one. 15, <laughs> it's gotta be one. 18. Um, having smart people around me right. who give me the leverage to do what I'm good at, the trust, the accountability, uh, I think there's, look, I wrote a book called Life Leverage, so I realise I'm part of the paradox, and I own that. But I think there's a lot of people that want this lifestyle where they've got a laptop and no problems, and no responsibilities. That's also a delusion. And, um, you know, freedom is not a lack of answering to anyone. Because if anyone's ever had a boss and then set up their own business, They've had this fantasy that working for themselves is better than working for their boss. And then a year down the line, they're lonely, they're overworked, they're stressed, they feel the pressure, the money's dipped. And you've still got to answer to all your yeah. customers. Yeah, they haven't suppliers. got a routine yeah. and all this stuff. that you haven't got holiday pay. When they're ill, they've still got to work. Yeah. So accountability is important, but sometimes it's painful. Like having a private um, PT who beasts you, and you're like, will you fucking leave me alone? And then afterwards, you're like drinking your protein shake, going, life is good, because you're finished, <laughs> and you've been beasted. Um, so, I'm, you know, I've learned that human beings step up the most when there's accountability, because the easiest person to lie to and let off the hook is yourself. So, you know, that's probably the greatest factor, because, and, and, and you know, that I, I don't want to, it's not false humility, because it's not something that I've done, but, you know, in, when I've tried in business and life, it, when I didn't have people around me, I failed because I didn't have accountability or I failed because I, I didn't have the skills or I failed because I've got skills in one area, but I've got big weaknesses in another. So great people around me, mentors, team, partners, finances, that's the most important thing. Brilliant. Thanks, Rob. So here's a disruptive question for the disruptive entrepreneur, right? Um, disruption eventually becomes the norm. And we've seen it time and time again. We're seeing it with electric cars replacing um, combustible cars. Uh, we've seen it with MSN Messenger, which was a great talk platform from a technology point of view, and Facebook Messenger has completely wiped the floor with it. Is there a danger with what you're doing that eventually you'll become the norm? You will lose that disruptive ability compared to when you first started? Hmm. Um, I've never been asked that question. It's a good question. And I don't want to be, um, I don't want to have cockiness and say, no, there's no danger because who's no, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. One thing I've learned about my life is I've got two choices, disrupt myself or someone or something else will fucking do it for me. Um, and so I try and control the narrative and think just before we're in a recession, maybe. Now, you can't time it, but, you know, like if you think prices are a bit high or whatever, can I plan for a recession when everyone else is doing the opposite? You know, am I notice engagement going down? Do I need to create a new product or service? Do I need a freshen up of myself? So I, I like I try and disrupt myself before an external circumstance, individual company, res re regulations can do that. So that's, tr I try and live that, that by that as a motto. Um, I, at some, yeah, I'm going to get blindsided and I'm going to get disrupted and I'm going to have difficulties in the future because blindsiding exactly that, i.e. a problem happened that you couldn't pl plan and prepare, prepare for, otherwise you'd have planned and prepared for it. But I also know that I get bored very quickly and I am always looking for the new thing because that is the nature of who I am. 
And so, like, in, in that regard, I think in one or two or five or ten years, I'll, I'll probably be embracing all these new crazy things. I think we'll be the, for example, we have a, um, a niche within our property company, um, and it's called deal packaging that you'll know about, which is sourcing properties. You keep some and you sell some to other investors. I believe Progressive will be the first company um, that embraces doing VR deal sourcing. Um, so when the technology in, a, in a, an iPhone or a camera gets good enough where you can just do that around a house and then it creates a full 3D render walkthrough that you can, someone can watch through their headsets. You know, because like if you're doing remote deal sourcing all over the country, which some people are, you know, meeting clients and going and doing viewings in Newcastle if you live in, you know, Newquay, it's, it's impossible. And, you know, like all these things start as clunky and not really working very well and then they get better and better and better um so you know we're there aren't any um, many other property companies that have invest uh, um, embraced bitcoin and cryptos like we do um we were the first to bring rent to rent and deal packaging to the property training community and space um, I was one of the early adopters of podcasts the uk guys obviously americans are, are, are way ahead um, yeah, we're going to be doing VR and AI and all this stuff. Mm. Um, I wanted, um, at our 2010 Property Super Conference, um, I wanted, um, as part of our recordings of the DVD, to have a drone flying around and doing all of it. And, um, you know, like that's sort of beginning, becoming normal now, and I wanted to do that in 2010. Couldn't get it past all the health and safety and all that, which was a bit annoying. It was at Wembley Stadium. Um, so disrupt yourself or someone else will disrupt you and you choose which one it's going to be. You either control the narrative or someone else is controlling it for you. I love that. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, Rob, we wanted to just ask, before we wrap up, we wanted to ask you about the foundation and uh, just talk a little bit about that with the launch of the new book, Money, as well. Mm. Tell us a little bit about that. So that's, I guess, another example of that because when I um, researched my book, Money, um, I had two research projects with money. One was my whole life and everything I'd learned, being raised to be an entrepreneur, getting nearly 50 grand in debt and having experience but squandering it and then becoming a millionaire before the age of 31 and then, you know, growing from there and building my companies and everything else. That was research project number one. Research project number two was reading every book, listening to every podcast, autobiography on Netflix of every millionaire, billionaire that I could find and then hiring an outsourcer to do, do the stuff I couldn't do. They were the two parts. Um, now, for years, Mark and I have given random 35 grand, 100 grand. We've given, I don't know, maybe not millions, but maybe hundreds of thousands, a decent amount of money we were making um, to charitable courses, ones that mattered to us, like Sue Ryder, where Mark's dad passed away and cancer research. My, Mark's dad had cancer and um, that kind of thing. But when I was doing all the research for all the billionaires and looking at the counter view, not the hate of you, um, most of them had foundations and many of them didn't start the foundations with a vision. They started it because society said, you're greedy bastards. You need to start giving a lot of it away. It's basically Bill Gates, etc., got forced into philanthropy through society pushing back. Now, that is the nature of species to do that because species will resist if one person gets too much control. Species will also resist if it's um, equally distributed because none of, none of those work. You know, that's why uh, communism didn't really work. It doesn't really work. Um, so I thought, rather than wait till I'm 65 and people start to go, Rob, you're making all this money. You've got all these Ferraris and watches and companies. Who do you think you are? You're a greedy bastard. I thought, well, I'll control the narrative and start it early. Because, you know, before you're 40, it's quite young to start a foundation. Um, and I wanted the money to go to the place that we believed in. Um, and also... I just wanted to talk to, to my haters, you know, because I've got enough of them and I thank them and tell them to fuck off, but I thank <laughs> them as well. Um, but like, if I write a book called Money, the one thing they could say, oh, is your profiteering? So I'm giving all the, <laughs> all the proceeds yeah. of that book, my proceeds of that book for life will go to that foundation. Um, and what's the core... Um uh, causes that yeah. the foundation supports. So um, I'm empowering and educating young and underprivileged entrepreneurs across the globe um, to get a better financial education and start the enterprises, wow. you know, whether they're their own businesses, part-time businesses, 
Um, that's the mission. That's great. That's Fantastic. an awesome mission. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, like, hey, look, you know, if, if it helps equally more people and helps me get my message out there with my book, then, then, then that's a good, fair exchange trade-off. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Well, Rob, that's us done. I just wanted to say thank you uh, for your time. It's been a really honest, revealing and inspiring interview. So, yeah, thank you very much. All right. Um, what's the best we way? We just had that moment where we all crashed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, it's time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do some of those guys do three-hour interviews oh, and podcasts? Know. I don't know. It's the weed or Any, the booze that yeah, they have on it, isn't it? Yeah, 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 that's it. We need to introduce booze, maybe. Oh, you don't drink either. Well, I don't drink. No, so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Just be me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Chocolate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's the best way for people to get in contact with you, Rob? Uh, man. Um, obviously, I wrote Money and Life Leverage if they're interested in books or audio books. And I've they done. can be found on Amazon and... Yeah. Amazon and Audible. Yep. I've got my podcast, Disruptive Entrepreneur and Money, mm -hmm. if either one of those you like. If you search me, Amazon, Facebook, Google you'll find me and you can follow me on those profiles, LinkedIn, wherever. So um, pr pretty active. Um, the, the platforms where I engage the most individually is LinkedIn and Facebook. Mm -hmm. So if people want to follow me there, mm -hmm. um, you know, I do read a lot of the private messages. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thanks again. Um, it's been, like Angela said, really, really inspiring. So, yeah, thanks for your time, Rob. And we, we want to know your thoughts on Rob's amazing journey. Send us an email at hello at yoursuccesspodcast.com or get in touch on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So thanks again, Rob. So, and thanks to you at home for listening. So please click subscribe, <laughs> leave us a review, and we look forward to your comments on our Facebook and YouTube channels. So I've been Anglos. And I've been Mo. And see you again on the next and exciting episode. And i to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> see you in the next exciting yes. episode. <laughs> I'll unplug this mic while I... <laughs> You have been listening to Your Success Podcast. Click subscribe for more incredible content. More details can be found at www.yoursuccesspodcast.com.